Welcome to South Help Graphics uh, Artist Lab in the studio. Uh, this is the second edition of our Artist Lab in the studio series. Uh, last week or the week before, we had a group of printmakers. Uh, I'm glad that all of you were, that got to visit us and see that episode. Uh, we got a lot of great feedback, so I'm glad you're here again with us uh, this week. Um, before we get started, um, today though, I, I feel since all the kind of things and energy that are happening in the world, uh, I wanted to read us a little uh, little blurb uh, written by my friend Arnaldo Vargas. Uh, he's an artist and educator, and he was one of the UTLA leadership during the strikes uh, last uh, school year. Um, and he wrote me these few words so that I could read um, so that we could kind of meditate on these things and think about them as we go on to the rest of our talks today. Um, so this is by Arnaldo Vargas. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the original people of the lands we all inhabit. I want to thank them for teaching us, teaching us of harmony and peace they have left us. We find ourselves in the midst of a challenging time. We are not only fighting for survival of our families and communities from a worldwide pandemic, but we continue to witness and experience senseless murders at the hands of law enforcement and white supremacists throughout the country. I would like to pay my respect to George Floyd, who was murdered in Minneapolis. May we continue to practice social distancing while staying spiritually connected. And with that, I'd like to take a one minute moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for everybody for participating in that one minute moment of silence. Uh, and also thank you much, very much to Arnaldo Vargas for giving us these few words to meditate on as we get into our program. Um, again, I'd like to thank Self Help Graphics for inviting me and inviting, we have like, I'm so excited everybody. Please, I'm, I'm really excited. We have two fantastic, thoughtful, engaging artists with us tonight. Um, I, I really feel privileged to be hanging out with these guys and uh, hear what they're up to and throughout this uh, COVID time, what they've been up to during pandemic time, what they've been up to in their studios, what they've been thinking about, what they've been putting their energy into as artists. Um, uh, we're each gonna do these 15 minute segments and then we're gonna get into kind of Q&A time, Alexa and is going to be kind of facilitating our time and taking care of us. Thank you, Alexa, and thank you, Marvea, for helping us get through this uh, meeting today. Um, everyone, we are been living through some really, really trying times. Like it feels like everything is just coming at us. It wasn't like these situations weren't happening pre-COVID. I think uh, we all know in our all of you I'm, are conscious folks, so I know you all know that there were a lot of things happening that were in continuum, in a continuum trajectory of like oppressive states and all this stuff for 
decades and like centuries now, right? Um, so we've been dealing with these uh, situations and putting a full fourth effort of not only defensive strategies, but also offensive strategies. And I'm hoping that us uh, getting together today is one of these uh, modes and models of offensive strategy that we're going to be interjecting into the world. Uh, so I, I, I was asked by, by Marea, like, okay, Mario, like, who would you think would be folks that you would want to be uh, talking with or in conversation with uh, during um, your uh, in the studio uh, artist lab visits? And I was thinking about because in our, our artist roundtable, our kind of council that advises the programming, uh, one of the members, uh, Dali, Dalia, or Dalida, Dalia, sorry, Dalia, she said, she, she said something in passing, like, oh, we're the Yelders. And I was like, what's the Yelders? Like, yeah, I get yelled at, and yeah, I like to yell, but that's not a Yelder. She said, a Yelder is the young elders and i was like whoa that's dope that's like the young lords in new york city or something right like the elders i wanted to get like a, a one percent motorcycle gang jacket that said the elders on it like i wanted to kind of <laughs> claim that title right the elders but i was like okay well the elders the young elders you know because of course you know i read the statement we have these antepasados we we have elders in our community that have been in resistance struggle for a long time, also in like a, an aesthetic resistance struggle, right? With, with, through culture, music, the arts, uh, fashion, all this stuff. And um, they have a lot of wisdom to impart with us. But um, I'm like, oh man, I'm getting like gray hairs too, man. I'm not like a young cat anymore. And um, I'm like, who are my peers? Like who, who are my colleagues out there that I see constantly putting in the work uh, putting themselves as kind of a frontline positioning in terms of like wrangling uh, resources, wrangling eyes, wrangling people together uh, to uh, to see culturally relevant things in the city of Los Angeles, uh, not just kind of cut and paste from like the rest of the globe, right? Like, uh, you know, like we're not just getting the same cookie color cookie cutter mall culture that happens sometimes in larger institutions right but like who's doing the on the ground work and um both of these uh artists came to mind like ami ha i know has been doing a lot of work over the years uh and as of late i don't know past uh, i don't know less than a decade but getting there close has been the director at the the William S. Grant Center, Art Center on the west side of LA in the Adams District. And, you know, Rafa Cardenas, who is a photographer uh, and kind of Boyle Heights native, Boyle Heights native, but really has been involved also in producing culture uh, through the years. And, um, you know, these kinds of folks have like their ear to the ground when uh, in terms of facilitation, right? Like, uh, like one of the quotes I like to say when I talk to students is that we need to learn to facilitate and stop to play or hate, right? Like how do we facilitate and not play or hate? And sometimes people ask me like, what do you mean Mario? What does it mean to facilitate and not play or hate? Well, first of all, if you don't know right off the bat, you don't know. <laughs> and, I, and I can't always be like, telling you but since we have this like wider audience today i'm gonna let you know facilitate what the way i was taught by my elders and my mentors uh mostly manasad gamboa who was a poet and playwright and dixie swift who was a a, a, a activist and a kind of a facilitator of space they both founded a place in long beach called a, a homeland cultural arts center and that's where I grew up and my wife kind of grew up going there. And um, we were taught that we were not supposed to be as teachers, as, uh, as young people trying to be in the community and you know do things and be active. We were, not, we were taught to not be uh, uh, top-down missionaries, right? Like 
we weren't we were top we were working with communities and children and and different folks that we were supposed to actually they would get mad at us if we had that attitude we would be like no they would be like no that's not how you do it you need to go into a community and see what that community already has in relationship to culture they're already it's already popping in most communities. They already got some style of dance. They already got some form of communication. They already got oral traditions. They already got all these things. And if you're gonna go in there with your uh, highfalutin, you know, art education and just be like, yo, this is how we do it. It's like, you got these instruments, these tools and not be open to listening to what those folks uh, are bringing to the table, then that's not, not the way to do it. So facilitating is coming into a space, understanding what already kind of exists there, what the folks are already pitching and making in relationship to culture. And then as a facilitator, you could help build on that situation, right? Or help put a little bit of structure behind it or help get resources to it. But you're not a top town like, oh, I got culture, I'm gonna give it to you. Like, hey, that's, that's not how it works. And um, so facilitate, not player hate. And player hate, is when you try to like stop people from getting what they need to get, what they deserve of receiving, right? Like we should all be in like a kind of receiving mode all the time and open to things, you know, because we deserve things, right? We deserve good things in our lives. We deserve stuff, you know, we deserve gifts. We deserve a good life. And this is one of these things that gets us so upset when we see these oppressive forces murdering folks on the street because we, understand fairness and we understand what is not right and was not just and this is what gets us upset so uh, so player hating is that when you block people from getting what is just deserves to them deserve to them what they're in line to receive right that that is player hating so, so or just lifting what they've already brought to the table for you and jacking it as culture right like that's not good that's not good and you know we see that a lot and that's what gets us so upset we 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 get upset at these things and um you know and um it gets my voice all high pitch and my blood pressure all off and <laughs> it gets us all out of whack so man man we gotta we gotta that's like facilitate not player hate so these folks that i invited today um ami and rafa in in true form have been community facilitators like uh, to the end, right? And we're elders, we're young elders. So I wanted to say like, what are my peers up to? Cause I know for the most part, uh, I talk to younger students to like kind of mentees, right? And, um, you know, I'm usually the one giving the advice. I'm usually the one, you know, sometimes, you know, my kids are super wise beyond their age and they give me nuggets that I hold on to. And I'm really happy, happy to have because it is when you have good students and teachers, and it is reciprocal cycle. It isn't just one way, right? It's give and take. So like if your students are giving you those things, man, I really appreciate them. And I'm like, wow, you're, you're wise beyond your years. But for the most part, I'm in the kind of giving mode. I'm the one giving advice and stuff. So I'm like, hey man, like who, me we were talking the other day and we were like, well, who mentors the mentors, right? Like, and uh, Ami brought up a really great point that we are kind of on a, a, a lateral playing field and we help each other. We should be giving, we should be the ones that we're reaching out to each other as a peer group. Like y'all, if you're younger or older, you reach out to your generation as a kind of a first uh, sounding board place for your ideas. And I was like, yeah, man, like I need to reach out to these folks because I, whenever I, I've, I've had the pleasure of being able to hang out with them, I've seen their work and I hear what they say and I'm like, yo man, I could learn from these people. So my peer group, number one, I got to look out for my peer group and they look out for me. And um, Alexa, am I good on my time? <laughs> Where are you at? But- um, You're still good. Okay, so um, that's what I've been up to. That's why I brought these two magnificent folks to the table to, to chop it up with us and to visit with them. Uh, so I just wanted to set that up in a kind of, pace for what I've been up to because uh, this is my studio for now is my kitchen here at the house and for the most part what I've been doing for work I, I kind of decided at the beginning of COVID that um, with the stay home order that I wasn't going to be drawing or making stuff 
like I normally do. I decided that I'm gonna like be observant and kind of look at what's going on and and check in with people. Uh, so for the most part, I've been like all y'all zooming and on my FaceTime and my WhatsApp and all these types of things, like checking in with folks so I could get a kind of, uh, you know, kind of perspective on what's going on and how different artists are affected by the situation. But but not only how they're affected, but how they're showing leadership. Like, I think that that's uh, one of the things that artists do at, um, you know, at an accelerated rate. And um, these two in particular that I have with me today. So let's see, like, how, how are we providing leadership how are we taking on that role? Do, do we accept it, not accept it? Do we think that we're the kind of uh, early adopters to sorts of things? I know a lot of my artist friends do things early, like Carla, my wife, she was like the first one I remember to have a Facebook and the first one to have an Instagram. Like I'm late, I'm late to all those types of things. Even Zoom, she had to teach me how to do Zoom. So, you know, like the artist people I know around me, like. Rafa, when we had a meeting, he was kind of shaming me because I was behind on Zoom skills. But um, yeah, man, how are we doing this? How are we adopting and how are we adapting? How are we shifting energy? How are we, the big word of the COVID, how are we pivoting, right? Like, <laughs> I've heard that word so much, like pivot, like how are we pivoting, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to step into Ami Studio. She's going to go tell us some great stuff. Then we're going to step over into Rafa's place and he's going to tell us some great stuff. And then we're going to field questions. So without any further ado, uh, let me pass the microphone over to Ami. And Ami, take it away, please. OK, so um, there's there's a little uh, ado because I was just putting up my hair because you know I just uh, I, I wanted to go matchy matchy with my outfit, and I figured, like we said before, we wanted to match the uh, the time. So um, there's actually a protest happening just outside my house on the freeway. So the bird is up, and you can probably hear it. Um, and I'm I'm hoping everyone out there stays safe and and um, and gets their voices heard. But um, with that said, welcome to my studio. Um, my studio is this tiny room in, in my house, but I'm lucky to have that actually. But um, my studio is in my brain. Um, my studio is sometimes in my car and you know, sometimes on my lap. And at one point it was a little coffee shop that I would go to in, in South Pasadena because I was living in my car, so I couldn't have my studio in my car. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, yeah, studio is like a state of mind, right? So, um, so, Basically, the work adjusts as the state of mind changes. And um, we were talking about ways that we kind of, um, we organize and lead and, and collaborate and transform and create change and all of that. And um, I'm really interested. I've, I've been reflecting on that quite a bit because I've done that for many, many years. And yeah, you're right. Actually, for 15 years, I've been at the William Grant Still Life Center. I was the education coordinator there. I'm now, I've for the past 10, close to 11 years, I've been um, the director there. And, um, and I'm only 25, so I'm an overachiever. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, it's, that's, that's been a blessing. I mean, it's been really beautiful, a beautiful experience and, and getting, um, Getting to really focus on on grassroots archives there, getting to connect with people that you know I kind of grew up with, um, bringing in some of my mentors that I've worked with in the past to assist and guide, and that's been really lovely. And yeah, you're right. I remember you know you said your, your mentors were tough on you. I have one mentor, and um, I love him. He's a photographer and a revolutionary, Ron Wilkins, and. I remember one time I had a fever. I had organized a group of students. I, that was when I was organizing the students at Lock High School. I organized a group of students and I had some parents coming out and I got a fever that day and I couldn't go. I was like, I just can't go. Man, he called me up. He was like, you don't organize something and not show up to your own event. You can go sit behind a glass or something like that, but you better show up to your own thing. So I was like, okay. So <laughs> I went. 
Um, and he's right, you know, I mean, he, he was really tough on me as were other beautiful mentors I've had throughout the years. And, um, and, it, and I appreciated it. Um, I've, uh, I've been interested in bringing folks together for a very long time, obviously in my art class at Locke High School. Um, in the art class were, was where while drawing and painting and discussing art history and all of those classes is where um, young people had the space and, and the ability to open up about issues of repression that were going on at the school that were extreme, extreme violence and extremely um, abusive. So, and that was in their school. So, you know, I know for a fact that that, 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 that space of, of allowing your creative juices to flow, of, of seeing art as a space of visual philosophy, that's where a lot of stuff can come out. And it was beautiful to experience that with, with young people. And I, to this day, I mean, it's an experience that I have never forgotten. Of course, I didn't forget because I got five pink slips. And I went through uh, three years of civil rights lawsuits myself and my students against the school. But, but that's not the only reason. I didn't forget because um, my students were extraordinary. And, um, and I learned so much from that experience. And then went on to organize many other things. I've been interested in, in um, for, for a long time in, in um, galvanizing, you know, kind of like, uh, I guess, I guess, uh, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, you know, like Jadena says, like my tribe, right? And, um, and reaching out to what people call Swana communities. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm really embracing the term Swana, the Southwest Asian, North African terminology, but, um, but I've definitely been interested in that because I've been looking at, at um, histories uh, of, of definitely the history of everyday people from Iran. I'm interested in that because history's always been, been documented and presented through the perspective of kings. And, um, and I'm interested what everyday people do. So I've been working on that and um, organizing with different folks on who, who think likewise. Uh, and just to highlight a few experiences and I'm gonna try and share my screen so y'all can see. Um, uh oh, uh, Alexa, do you think I can share my screen, please? But um, once I do, I want to share maybe a couple of things that I've done in the past with um, in terms of community work. And um, you and I, Mario, actually, we we did this resident. You did this residency, I think, just before me when you went to our Hoof Denmark, and we're working in a in a, um, a housing project called Gelaruk. It's a beautiful space, and I'm going to try and find it here for y'all so you can see. Or uh, maybe not. <laughs> oh, here we go. So um, in in Gellerup, and I showed up there, and uh, it's it, it's in Denmark, and it's a beautiful community with like uh, it's Danish modern, gorgeous apartments, except that in this housing project. Um, you know, large families, sometimes two families are sharing one apartment. I had the privilege of having one really large apartment with two bedrooms and two bathrooms and all of that. But, um, and a gorgeous studio that um, was painted beautifully with so much love by Mario just before. So we got to transform this and I wanted to create a space of multiple feminisms because all I would hear during that time that I was there was, um, you know, these people, these people, Probably the housing project was 90% um, Muslim, people from, um, from Iraq, from um, Afghanistan, from um, Turkey, from Somalia, from Palestine, uh, a little bit at that time coming from Syria and Lebanon. Um, but it, it, was a, it was, like I said, 90% um, Muslim. And the country would not allow the building of any masjids. And I won't say mosque because mosque is actually a derogatory term. So our, the house of worship is a masjid. And, um, and then also uh, people couldn't get jobs. They were kept when they were refugees, they were kept in refugee housing for um, four years and couldn't get jobs and couldn't go to school. 
And then eventually once they were released and kind of um, refugee nationalized into Danish culture, they were, they were told that they had to, um, they had to assimilate. However, they weren't getting jobs. And so they were hanging out and finding underground um, solutions. And there uh, I was hearing that, you know, it's a really sexist society, you know, the women are oppressed and everything else. So I really wanted to create an art club um, that was a way of expressing um, multi-feminist perspectives. So we started the Fantastic Femmes there. And that was a really incredible experience for me. The young people I met there were extraordinary. Again, I learned so much and I felt really connected because in Denmark, a lot of the refugees were similar to myself. They came from low income or working class backgrounds. Um, whereas in the States, um, I'm connecting with um, Swana individuals who are mostly wealthy and very privileged. So I, re I felt so at home and it was so lovely. I had the privilege of carrying this on in, in Germany, carrying on the project in Germany and in, in, uh, in Detroit and Hamtramck and, um, and being able to just kind of create a space where we talk about our perspectives and the fact that, that you can be feminist um, with your own history and your own lineage. So that was a really lovely experience. Um, I did a few other organizing projects. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about how um, here in, in the States, I, I um, have been really working on creating kind of the tribe, which is, um, I mean, there's a there's a term I kind of started using quite a bit, and that's um, muzis. So I, I I used to get called a muzi by my ex in a derogatory way. He he was Coptic Christian, and he was like, "Oh, you damn muzis," you know. And that was like his way of saying Muslims, right? But I really kind of liked it because it wasn't just being Muslim; it was actually being um, like culturally Muslim. Uh, and um, for me, it was like freaking it, right? It was being slightly different um, than than um, than the way that you would typically think of of Muslim. So um, anyway, uh, I've been trying to work with with people who are culturally Muslim, queer, uh, non-gender binary, not fitting the stereotypes, not not the type that 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 television tells us is what our community is. Um, but really kind of creating our own community and having the multiplicity that exists. So with that, I started numerous projects and um, I'm showing you right now some images from a project that I, that I started called Golestan Revisited. And Golestan Revisited is based on a, a, a book of poetry uh, by um, Saadi, the poet, Sufi poet Saadi, Iranian Sufi poet, which means a collection of, of of flowers, it actually means like garden or a collection of flowers, but it was actually a collection of poems. But what I did was I decided, I, I had been looking at roses, the origins of roses, the fact that roses were actually stolen during the crusades and the first, very first rose that is the origin of most of the hybridized roses um, was probably from, um, sorry, I think, I think I'm probably um, going over my time, it was probably from Iran. Um, so uh, with that, I did the research and uh, have been looking at all the hybridized roses and their names as well. That was really interesting to me. At the same time, I was also doing research on um, people who were getting killed um, post-2009 in the various wars that are called the Neo-Crusades, right? So 2009 being a, a pivotal point where um, the US resources no longer had to go as, as heavily into the killing of my people. <laughs> and uh, people were pitted against each other and killing each other while drones were dropping bombs. So um, I started to document um, women and femmes um, and girls who were killed in the process because I found that a lot of times uh, women and femmes and girls have the least agency in, in, in the, the fact if, if they could live or die. And, um, and then I started to name the roses after them. With that, I did several other projects that are part of the Golestan Revisited. And um, I will share the screen with you again so I can show you that. I apologize if I'm all over the place with this, but I suppose you all can ask questions later as well. Um, 
I did some performances. I'm really interested in the rituals around um, Shia Islam. There's the month of Muharram, which is the, the month of mor mourning and Ashura, which I will again participate this year and I will have a live performance again this year uh, for the month of Muharram. And I really wanted to queer Muharram and I mean queer it in, the, in every sense of the word. And, um, and, and in queering it, it doesn't mean that I take away the tradition and I actually, I actually probably go back to the origins and the tradition. Um, the rituals around Mahadam are, are rituals of, of, of pain in trance and pain as, as a form of, of releasing trauma. And so I did a performance um, last year, Mahadam, and um, you can see I, I was highlighting some of the women that I've been, I've been focusing on and I did um, a performance with some friends. Um, and the performance is generally like a uh, chest beating to the rhythm of a drum and you can kind of hear it um, the way that that your your chest becomes very percussive and it puts you in a trance-like state and um, I, I wrote a song and it was performed by a couple of friends and um, the song was in the tradition of, of uh, Shia songs called Nohe and um, I in the meanwhile was um, beating my back with a whip of chains so uh, that was performance number one and then I did another performance and we'll probably continue to do some performances with, um, with my blood. Um, so I uh, drew, I drew um, some blood out and um, it was fresh blood. Um, and with my own blood, I, um, I kind of did a painting over the sky, skyline of, of downtown Los Angeles. You know, track 16 has a beautiful window and they were kind enough to allow me to put this uh, vellum sheet up there and be able to create a painting. And in this painting, I, um, I wrote the names, I painted roses and wrote the names of the women that I've been researching and changing the names of the roses to with my blood. Um, and it was a way of kind of um, shedding some of my blood to reflect how much blood has been shed by these women. And, it, and it's very much along the lines of, of Shia Sufi, um, uh, ritual mourning. And um, these are practices that I'm also in, interested in and, and delving deeper into spiritually. What I have been doing lately is um, I, I was talking with a friend and this friend of mine is, um, I, you know, I won't give the details of, of my friend because if I said, you know, many of my other friends would kind of know who it is, but this friend of mine has dealt with numerous traumas, just layer upon layer upon layer of trauma, while also um, having issues with illness. And so when the quarantine happened, when the pandemic happened, um, this was really triggering her in an intense way. And I, I'd been taking her with me to some, um, some Sufi uh, rituals and, and practices. And I told her about a book called The Conference of the Birds. And I was really interested in reading this book because I'm interested in letting go and in releasing and letting go completely. And, um, and interested in, in delving into this book and seeing how I can let go so that my soul can fly. Um, and so, we, when I told her about it, she said, I wanna read it, but I can't read. Um, my, I, I'm having such intense flashbacks and trauma that my dyslexia is kicked in and I can't visibly read. And I remembered a story one of my, my mentors told me, Kumasi, Kumasi was locked up for many years and he was an organizer in prisons. And he told me years ago when they were doing a lot of Pan-Africanist work in, in uh, California prisons that, um, he and, and some of his brothers would, would get books, revolutionary books like Fanon's Wretched of the Earth or other books, whatever books people wanted to read. And they would read it aloud because the same situation was happening in prisons. Some people had never received the education to be able to read properly, but others um, just couldn't read because they had experienced so much trauma that, that their eyes just couldn't pick up the words. And that to me was such an act of love it was so striking and so beautiful to me and it really affected me in a deep way. And so I thought it would be good to start a, a reading group. And so every Tuesday evening, except last night, I had a heavy night. I had a, um, someone I know pass away. And um, so last night we did not meet, but every Tuesday 
we come together, it's a loose group kind of flowing in and out, but there's some diehards that come every week and um, we meet and we read aloud the Conference of the Birds and we allow um, the Conference of the Birds to uh, direct our conversation in whatever direction it's gonna go in. And it's been really lovely. So that's what's been going on lately. I hope I didn't talk too much. Ami, we have one question for you. The sure. performance piece that you shared, can you share where the performance took place and how it was received? Sure. Um, I'm not sure which one, but I'll share both. Uh, the one up here in green, uh, a friend of mine um, has a club that she started called Disco Stan. So I asked if I could do it at Disco Stan and she, she agreed. And, and um, you know, because really in terms of organizing and coalescing um, a club in, in queerness, a club is the perfect space. At first we got, um, we got a lot of people that gave us love, but there were some people that were really salty. They, they threw a lot of shade on us. Um, and, you know, people who were pr pretty didactic in terms of the way that, that they received how this ritual was going to be expressed. But we did it. And those who felt it, felt it. And those who didn't, didn't. Then um, this one, uh, the one at track 16, was part of a performance project at... Um, it's called Irrational and Deborah Oliver organizes it. So Deborah Oliver was kind enough to ask me to perform at Irrational exhibits and, and, um, and uh, we, I got this beautiful um, window to work with and I was able to do this performance. And a friend of mine, I was talking about this and a friend of mine, Reggie Williams was saying, it's best I think if you actually show the story somehow. So I actually held up my iPad and I had the stories. And so I would literally go up to people and interact and have them read the, the stories. And the responses were intense. So people were like, some people were just about to cry right there because they're here they are at an opening and they want to socialize. And, and then they're like confronted with this and um, other people were disgusted. And um, it, it, was, it was interesting, it was definitely. And some people wanted to embrace me except I'm, I'm pretty cold exterior when I'm performing. So <laughs> they didn't embrace me. And I usually have a wrangler. My friend Soraya Medina is, is usually my, my wrangler or, or uh, Byron Jose. So uh, my wranglers are always looking out for me and making sure that um, you know, no one actually uh, uh, harms me or does anything to me when I'm doing my performances. But most people are really kind. The only, the only performance I've ever done where people tried to harm me was actually in LA when I was doing this, this performance called um, uh, Stupid Muslim Joke. And, um, and yeah, people, people kind of, they, they, went a little overboard with their touchiness. <laughs> but apart from that, it was good. Thank you, Ami. So I'm going to be yeah. your regular today. OK, okay. <laughs> I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. OK, so now we're going to step on over to uh, who I like to call one day when I get to write an essay about him. I'll call him the eyes and fears of Los Angeles, uh, Mr. Rafa Cardenas. Can we step over into your space now, sir? Yes, I think I'm unmuted, right? You can hear me? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Well, what an amazing story uh, from both of you. I want to thank uh, Mario for that intro that you gave both of us in the beginning. I, I'm really honored to be in your circle, really honored to be in this group of people that you have put together. And, and to say that you learned from me, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I want to thank Alexa and self Help Graphics and Marbella um, for putting all this together. This is uh, definitely something um, cool that we can still reach out to each other and talk to each other during these times and share these kind of ideas. Um, what I decided to do was something um, more like of a presentation kind of thing. So I'm going to share my screen and share with you guys a little bit just of my story or my trajectory of how I got to where I am. Especially um, because this year, 2020, I started off doing a 365 day photo shoot. And um, I'm doing it because I started doing photography in 2010 and that was a 365 day photo shoot. Um, so I just kind of want to do like a trajectory from the beginning till now. And um, I have some images that I'm going to share with you guys. So let me share my screen. And 
there. Um, can you guys see all this? Yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna talk over all the images while it keeps going. Um, I started, you know, doing um, theater and film first when I was, you know, I always wanted to be some kind of an actor or artist or something. I didn't know yet. I, would, I was even embarrassed to call myself an artist in the beginning because I didn't, I never like had any art score or anything like that. So I just kind of started doing theater and film and theater and film is what got me into doing a lot of being around artists and being around people that think differently and, and, and you know, use the world around them to express their feelings and use their own emotions to use their own emotions to convey stories and, and sometimes stories that they wrote themselves and sometimes stories other people wrote. But after that, I was able to um, get into a band called Slow Rider. And when I was in that band, we did some music, we toured some shows and it was a really good time for me too. And, and um, I didn't know what I was gonna do for a while after all that. I mean, the, the music wasn't, you know, something that was sustainable and I actually left that band after a while and then after that, um, I was lost for a little bit. I was, I was doing work, I was doing graphic design. I was trying to stay busy. And I knew that I wanted to work for myself. And at one point I just picked up a camera and I started to shoot. <clears throat> I was writing for a magazine too at that time, actually. I was writing for a magazine and I started to want to take my own photographs for the, for the magazine. So I picked up a camera and started taking pictures myself and I decided that was in 2009. So for 2010, I decided that I was going to sh shoot the entire year because I knew that I needed to really learn how to use my camera. And I knew how to, I wanted the whole thing of taking photos to be second nature. So 2010, I carried a camera everywhere I went all day. I would take hundreds and sometimes thousands of pictures per day just to come back and edit and, and just dive into editing. Editing was one of the funnest things for me to actually get home and stay up late looking through every single frame and finding something like this story here. Um, I call this one Better Luck Next Time, number 13. This is during the Garfield Roosevelt game. And uh, Roosevelt had lost the game, but his girlfriend was still, you know, there <laughs> saying, it's okay, baby, it's okay, you know, uh, next year. <laughs> but it's also like Better Luck Next Time, number 13, because 13 is a bad luck number. But um, if you're superstitious so that was some of the themes that I covered there and and then uh, a lot of my work has a lot of uh, loneliness and anonymity I used to always like walk around downtown alone and take pictures and and I picked up a lot of things like this during that time so I did a lot of photos during the, that whole first year of course but I continued shooting and continued shooting and it turned into something and I started putting together my own shows. I started January of 2010 and by October of 2010, I put together my first exhibit at Eastside Love, a bar and they allowed me to put up images and I had my first show and it was pretty successful. There was a lot of people there. So it, it, it just, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that it, it just kept growing on top of itself and it just kept growing and, and, and it hasn't stopped since then. So after five years of shooting and putting images together and archiving them, I decided that I was going to make a book. So in year five, I made a book called Mas Aka, Closer to Here. Um, when I was in a band, we had an album called Mas Allá, and we were in outer space. We were like in a lowrider in outer space. So that was Mas Allá. So my first photography book, I wanted to call it Mas Aka, Closer to Here. And I was here on earth and with the people and close to um, humans, et cetera. And that's how we got that title for that. Masaka was a hundred images. And I, I wanted to put that out as like my graduation piece. Like I felt like I had been shooting for five years and that book was what I was gonna show that I was like, I've, I finished my school. <laughs> so those five years of, of my first, um, like I guess deep dive into photography, I, I put together some image, images that really um, resonated with people and and because of everything that I've done and, and this book, you know, it's it's still it's still something that's snowballing. I just I don't know how else to explain that, but it continues to move. It continues to move um, my process. It continues to guide me. It continues to to um, inform the way that I work. 
Um, by the way, the book Masaka, I put it available on my website. Um, uh, it'll be at the end of this. Um, of the end of this, you'll see my website, but it's rafa.la. And I've made a small one available because it was a limited edition, but big book, but I made a small um, eight by 10 available. Anyways, so after all these exhibits and everything that I did, um, I, I put together a lot of my own shows and, and people started inviting me to do shows. People wanted to collaborate with me. Self-help graphics actually um, were the first people to start hiring me as an uh, event photographer. So I started to do some work for them as an event photographer. So photography became <clears throat> my main source of income after a while. I would, I just decided to do event photography for uh, a living and have been doing that since about 2011. Um, and then some, after, you know, putting together my own exhibits and stuff, I was really fortunate to do some things with um, self-help graphics. They, they, um, I've been in a couple of exhibits that they've put together, but then also Vincent Price Art Museum called me and invited me to do my first solo show. And um, I, I was blown away when, when um, I got that call from Pilar that she wanted to come to my studio and see what I had in the works and asked me to be in a show. I couldn't believe that. And then right after that, I did a show with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, um, downtown LA. And that was a show that was, um, I had been shooting all black and white, so I challenged myself to make that show all color. And it was my biggest show to date. There were 60 images in that show, and they were, they were all previously unpublished photos uh, in color. Uh, so I started to shoot for that thing. We called the, the show Landscapes and Land Dwellers. And I'm currently still working on, it's ridiculous because the show's already over, but we didn't finish the, the book or the catalog. So I'm working on that and I'll be releasing that real soon. I'm gonna be doing a Zoom with them next month in June and I'll be talking about that book. Um, I'm gonna go through all these real fairly quick as you know, oh, I hang around with a lot of musicians. So I'm lucky that I get to have access to some people and get some images that uh, maybe other people wouldn't get when I'm around um, these people and some bands. Let me, I don't wanna go through these, these too fast, but these are some of my favorite photos that I shot. Um, things that are in my <laughs> and so when I did Can you hear me? Okay, so I'm back on. I think I lost you guys for a minute. Okay, so um, with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, I started to do some color shows. I mean, I mean that was my first color show and the book is gonna be out soon. Um, I'm still working on that, honestly, and, and it's taking a lot longer than I thought, but the um, designer is um, working with me and, and we should, Hope, I'm gonna do it, like I said, I'm gonna do a talk with La Plaza in June and I'll be talking about that book really soon. So I kind of made mine really fast. Um, did I lose you guys again? I don't see it. Oh, here you are. Um, so, hold on. What I was gonna say was, am I still sharing my screen? No, oh, that's what happened. Okay, let me just finish this. Sorry, I don't know what happened here. So uh, with the Plaza de Cultura y Artes, um, Landscapes and Land Dwellers, that show was my first color show and it was challenging putting that whole thing together. 
you know, I, I, I just go around and I shoot a gazillion pictures. I don't really have a, a, a deep um, plan ahead of time, but you know, as I walk around and I shoot, I, I start to put things together. And by the time I put the shows together, um, something coalesces. And now we're here. This is like recent shots that I've shot only during the pandemic. I, in the beginning, I was really didn't want to come outside. So my shots were very dark. <laughs> I, didn't, I really was scared to come outside and um, just stayed in a lot. And uh, that was the first sign when uh, my landlord actually <laughs> said nobody outside in the patio and she flipped the <laughs> chairs. I did, not, I did not stage that. That was done by somebody else. I'm not sure who. Um, and then uh, little by little, I started walking around and, and getting images of people with masks and stuff. And I've kind of had to really change the way I shoot. And, and I mean, this was a, a Mother's Day for my mom. We had mariachi, but even the mariachi wore masks, you know? And, uh, but a lot of shots are like this from, from the car. I've been shooting a lot from the car, from the passenger side window. And um, this one I shot while on a bike and um, just lucky that that kid was passing by there when I, when I was shooting that. And this was yesterday as I walked the street and this was today. I went out and got some shots today before I had to come back here and do this. So I, I made it to the protest and I, I still hear the helicopters outside too. And, um, yeah, so we're back to here. And this is my website, rafa.la, if anybody's interested in looking some more. I mean, I I flew through this, maybe I, maybe I didn't, maybe I went too fast or maybe I didn't cover enough, but I'm, I do wanna finish with saying that I do have a, a show with LACMA, um, my first show with LACMA. They've invited me to be a part of a photography group show uh, with all California photographers called California Golden Hour. So, Looking forward to that. And I guess I can just open it up to questions now or chat. That is beautiful. Wow. Yeah. See, you guys are amazing. Yes, I like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get to hear you, you guys talk. For like many years we've known you, know. you, I think we're pretty lucky as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, did, um, um, there's, they were supposed to be collecting, I don't know if they did, they were going to be collecting um, some uh, questions for us through the Facebook. Alexa, did we get any? No questions yet, all right. Um, but yeah, that's amazing, both of you, these kind of, both, we should make a show that is both like the eyes and fears of Los Angeles, like uh, all of these different overlapping intersectionalities of like where people think, uh, you know, where they place their fear on, um, like, Ooh. You know, like you acknowledging, Rafa, that you were afraid to go outside at first and you were taking these photos and you on me with the uh, ask a Muslim or dumb Muslim question jokes or something like that, where the okay. people get afraid. Like we're really having to face our ourselves in in this time. And it it, it seems like we are trying, maybe we have like a, de a delusional sense of what we're supposed to be looking at, but it's not really there. Or maybe we're trying to find what we're look, looking for. Like I like Rafa that you were saying that you go out and you don't know necessarily what you're looking for. You, you let it find you. Can you talk about that a little bit more? How do you know when it finds you? It's funny because I do the same thing with writing too. Um, when I, I used to write a lot of um, stories or poetry and people used to be like well how do you start I just start with like it's kind of like uh, I guess improv writing you know just like I walked into a bar and you just keep going and continue the story so with photography because I I shoot every day it's it, you know I can't I, I guess some people could probably have a plan every day but I don't have a plan and, and I really just try to get as many photos as I can and during this time it's been really hard to get a lot of photos I I used to shoot thousands of photos a day and and now I'm lucky if I can get like 200 because I I have limited places to go or limited ability to be out in the streets yeah. uh, and even when I walk I try to not get a lot of the same thing but it's um yeah and then I then I just come home and and look through them and and try to create a narrative or find a narrative inside one of the photos and, and and with the titles that I give them I try to create a little story with just one nugget you know do title do titles for both y'all this is a question that um I have always give for my students because they make a work 
And then they call, I say, okay, what is it called? Or, and they're like, untitled. And I'm like, nah, nah, like untitled. I'm not, I'm not accepting untitled no more. As like a name of a, a piece. Like, how are you inspired by getting titles for things? I tell them they have to become eaves, eavesdroppers. So next time they go eat or they're outside or at a party, they have to like listen to like certain words. And if they hear a good thing that clicks, like that could be a title for something. Uh, how do you guys go about that naming things? Uh, naming is important. Naming is very important. I mean, um, you know, in, in this, in the case of roses, um, uh, well, my name. So, Motavali means keeper of the shrine, and my my people kept the shrine in northern Iran. We they still do. I mean, we're still the keepers of that shrine. Oh. And shrines are all over. And a lot of times shrines were kept and named after people who had enough money to have that. So, so really being conscious of naming is, is super important and naming canonizes. So for me, um, I'm really inspired um, by, first of all, connecting with everyday people and everyday experiences and using, using the kind of the ordinary like ordinary folks like myself as, as, as you know, highlighting, high, highlighting people like my family, you know, and, and, um, and naming in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Th this morning I was listening to something on the radio and uh, they were talking about, you should like, in terms of naming, you should choose your story, choose your name. But then they said, your name isn't what they call you. It's what you respond to. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's true. Like, if, if they could call you whatever they want, but what, what you choose to respond to is where you kind of like be what, what you kind of internalized as a name, right? So like keeper of the shrine, that's like also like an internalization of that, that that's like an empowering thing, not like, oh yeah, you know, that's great. Sometimes for me, I hear something just like those words you just said, like just hearing keeper of the shrine, like it'll play in my head for days, you know, yeah, it'll yeah. play in my head. And then I might see something and be like keeper of the shrine and i'll snap it yeah and then post it and then you know add that title to it but but it, it's a lot of word association in my head and uh you know image and word association yeah we have one question for you ami um okay. they're, they're asking um can you share a little bit about a little bit more about when you were talking about releasing and letting go so that your soul can be uplifted and fly like what what's the why are you trying to do that? Where, where is that coming from? I was actually making reference at that point to, well, I mean, I've been trying to do that for a while and, um, you know, I, I transgressed, but um, I was making reference to the book that we're reading in our book club that we're reading aloud together um, called The Conference of the Bird by Farid Adina Attar, who's a Sufi poet as well. And in the book, it's the story of how there's this one earnest bird that's trying to galvanize uh, a bunch of other birds together to go and see this kind of uh, very mythical and mystical bird called the Seymour. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in, in it's about this process. And in the process, each of these birds have certain personality characteristics that they either have to release or hold on to or whatever. And I think the let go is, is um, just releasing expectations of myself and of others, um, either embracing, embracing those personality characteristics or letting them go entirely so that I can fly and not obsessing over them. Um, the rituals, the Sufi rituals are all about that. The Sufi rituals of, of mourning or delight are all about um, chanting, you chant something so many times, so many times, or you do repetitive, repetitive actions so many times, so that that action becomes so uh, monotonous that it be becomes ingrained in your activity and it takes you to another space where you're not focusing on the practice anymore. So when I'm, when I'm beating my chest repeatedly, I don't focus on the pain anymore. The pain just starts to go away and I hear the rhythm and, and I go into a trance-like state. So, um, so trying to do that and be, be kind of in that space in everything I do, but it's, it's, um, it's a difficult practice of, of letting go, letting go of things like um, 
guilt or blame. Um, it's hard. Yeah, for me, I've been thinking about that a lot too lately. And I think like what I'm trying to let go of is the known, like the known of the trauma, the known of the like survivor uh, mentality, the known of like all of this stuff that keeps me in place, right? Like if I could let go of what I, the known, then I could step into the unknown, right? I could step into like this space of like receiving, like changing the paradigm. Like my big, my big mantra lately when I've been meditating is like, I'm, I'm, I re, I'm going to receive all this stuff. Like I've, I'm open because before I was like a super naysayer and very skeptical of everybody and everything like, nah, man, like nah, that, nah, nah. And even Carla will tell me like, if she's like, ha we have food at the table and she's like, do you want a piece of bread? And I'll be like, no. And then like a two minutes later, I'm like, can I have a piece of bread? She's like, I just asked you if you want a piece of bread. And I'm like, well, it's because I have all this trauma stuff about like saying yes to things. I'm like not trusting or whatever. I'm like, but I really do want a piece of bread. Like, you know what I mean? And um, yesterday I was really like, oh man, yesterday was a real receiving day. Like I got all these fun, great things. And the best thing ever was one of the, our studio mates put in a toilet in the studio. And I was like, yeah, that's like the best gift I've ever had in my life, a toilet. And uh, my dad, I think my dad has been leading that a little bit. Like he got a battery charger the other day and he sent me a picture of it and was so happy about his battery charger. And I was like, all right, like maybe there's something to this letting go of the known and trying to be open to the unknown and receiving. And uh, geez, there's something to it. We have another question here and it is open for anybody. Um, uh, they say, I wonder if you could each talk about the commitment and surrender in your work, the depth of your co commitment to the process, craft, research, and your surrender and where it takes you. Um, and, and a special like question part for Rafa, who are some of the photographers that influence you? So let's get to this like commitment and surrender. Um, if either one of you want to talk about that, like 365 days, like where do we find this notion of like being committed to our work? And then where do you just let it do what it needs to do? I, I think uh, it's for me, it's like Nessio, you know, like <laughs> Nessio. Like hard headed, like, hard headed. You're hard headed. And, and um, <laughs> to be honest, like for me, like I, I've done doing theater and all that and doing um, uh, film and, and music and then. I, I just always wanted to be some kind of visual artist and and I draw you know I draw all the time and stuff but you know my drawing's okay and then one day I just picked up the camera and it became like the easiest way to put art together for me <laughs> and, uh, once I started doing the three it wasn't intentional but once I started doing the 365 every day I was like wow this is really amazing like turnaround I can do this every day put it out and and and, and it's received well and and it became it became something that uh, it's really honestly like since January 2010 to now it's still what's driving my daily routine. It's still what you know, and it was just something that I started on the whim and and um, you know I, I guess I've surrendered completely to it. I I do um, whatever it asks of me as much as I could. Um, and 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 sometimes you know sacrificing family events and things like that just to get certain things done but not not that much anymore but there was a time where i would just like you know go crazy into this and, and not turn around right now i'm a little more spaced out when i shoot but <clears throat> um real quick i just want to talk about my my influences are, are um my or original influences was sebastian salgado joseph rodriguez and, and gregory bojorquez two neighborhood guys and one from south america how about you, Ami? Where does where does those two things take you? Um, I research quite a bit. Research is nonstop. Um, because I think just because I'm nosy. Um, so I, <laughs> I research because I'm nosy. <laughs> and then it, like, you know, I go on these tangents and stuff like that. And one research takes me to another, to another. So it ends up to, it really consuming me. Um, and, and, um, and if I don't research, then I end up looking at shoes online. So I better research and read. Um, but but uh, you know the the commitment to the process and craft is is deep. You know I've sacrificed a lot of things so I can express myself this way because I've noticed that if I I don't if if 
I don't continue to do my work and express myself and my philosophies and my ideas in a visual way that um, I, I'm, I lose my mind. Um, and um, I'm okay with losing my mind in some ways. I think that's okay. But I think in a, in a, in a more general, like constantly being super grouchy to people way, it's not good. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't want to be grouchy to everyone around me. So if I practice more, I'm kinder. So yeah, I'm working. For, I'm for working, those of I'm you who progress. know me, don't stand in my way, man. Let me, let me I'm a work in progress. Though. I'm a work in progress of not being grouchy. But, um, <laughs> but the, you know, it's really, it really is true. Like uh, the, the, the way that you say you found that moment, moment, este, Rafa, like picking up the camera and it being like this extension of you and the way you think it about like a kind of research practice on me, like there's just, I, I, I guess I had to come to the point of commitment and surrender when I understood there was nothing else I could do. There's just nothing, there's just nothing else I could do. Like, I, cause I would be like, oh man, like, cause I have this like crisis every couple, six months, let's say like, oh, what else am I going to do with my life? Like, I don't know if I want to be an artist and I don't know if I want to be this and that. And then I'm like, but what else am I going to do? Like, am I going to be a chef? Am I going to be a trash man? Like, and what the heck else am I going to be able to do? And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm going to be able to have these type of conversations if I'm anywhere else. Right. And to be honest with you, you know, art people for me are the best people because they're also unique. And I'm not saying that in a kind of, uh, you know, to be, uh, to be, I don't know what I'm trying to be, but, but you know what I mean? I'm not trying to just say that, like really art people are interesting. Like they, they find these things, these subject matters to pursue and they go after them wholeheartedly. And then they, you visit with them or talk to them and you're like, man, where did you come up with that idea? <laughs> you know, like how, what, where did you come up with that? And what made you go down that vein of research or ride your bike down that street? And thinking about like, that too, like just thinking about what you're saying, like, I, I, I don't, I guess I don't do like specific research where I'm finding something, but whatever my head goes into for a day, if my head is in there and then I go out and ride, like it's in my head and I'm riding with it. And, and I'm looking at things with it. And those words are in my head too. Like words are playing as I'm snapping. So I, I carry all that stuff with me. And at the end of the day, sometimes I might have a picture that's like, wow, that's a great picture. Like composition, everything is beautiful, but it's not saying what my head is telling me at that time. Mm -hmm. And my head is telling me to go in a different direction with, with whatever I'm gonna post on that day. Yeah. So, so even even just words and things that that I carry around with me because of conversations that I heard or discussions that I had with with friends, it's it's what what informs what's going to come out at the end of the day too. You know. Mm -hmm. But you you're know, also I, like I an feel. avid reader. You're uh, also an avid reader, uh, uh, the Rafa too. Like I'm losing my eyesight when she was talking about people that can't <laughs> read. <laughs> He didn't have to join your club so you could read aloud to him. I used to read a lot, and um, but now I mean I I I listen to um, Audible, which has helped me a lot. But it's not the same thing as having a book in your hand and and looking at the words and, and you know words words just they're they're a lot more beautiful on the page. I think. But, I think the combination is quite nice. You can sometimes um, when we read aloud sometimes. Some people will just listen. Some people like to do the reading and some people just like to do the listening and some people like to like read while listening. Yeah. And um, that happens. But you know, Rafa, you were saying something and I was thinking, um, you know, I think one of the things about art and Mario, you were saying this thing where you come to this um, kind of like existential space where you're like, should I be an artist? Well, what else can I do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel you. I'm there <laughs> with you constantly. Um, but you know, it is, it is a way that we can kind of question everything. And I think with, with us as, as people, I mean, we're, we're living, we, we are diasporic peoples um, or, or not necessarily diasporic, but indigenous peoples, but peoples who are considered not of the, uh, the uh, ruling group uh, in the United States. And so we're kind of on a defense all the time, right? And so I find myself in this space where I'm having to like constantly defend stuff that I actually should be questioning. 
you mm -hmm. know, but I'm defending it because the person that's coming at me is coming at me in the wrong way or the media or the outlet or whatever it is. And so art gives me the space to get nuanced and even question myself. I mean, throughout the years, and I think that you've seen that, Mario, like even, even you know, I, I was, like I said, I was trained by revolutionaries and I was, a, I was a good soldier. I listened to them. If they told me, don't talk to this person, I didn't. If they told me, go do this, I did that. I did what they told me. And I am at the space now where I'm like, well, why was that? Let, let me question, why wasn't I supposed to talk to this person? Because I want to know myself. And I want to get into nuances because times have changed. You know, there was a time that I was all about like resource nationalism. You know, I was like, everyone should nationalize their resources. Well, I've gone to Iran and I've seen what nationalism has done. And it's basically the same type of class structure, just, just labeled differently, right? There's still an extreme amount of poverty and suffering. So it forces you to question things, you know, as an artist, because you look at the world differently, you're able to question things in a, such a nuanced way that I think other people, not even scientists have the capacity to question in the way that we do, because, um, because our approach and our praxis is different, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up as like a sustaining point for artists that we bring up questions and, um, and we are all constantly questioning. And um, I think sometimes artists or young artists that I deal with, they're thinking that they're trying to come up with the answers. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not your job. Your job is the questions. I, I, I tell them, I remember watching this documentary about mathematicians and they're saying like, you know, that all the 19th, like where, where did all the 19th century mathematicians end up? They all ended up in the sanitarium and the, in the, in the crazy homes because they thought they were looking for truth with the capital T in their equations. Then they said that the 20th century, they're all kind of, they got over that. So they knew that they were only working on certain aspects of an equation and that was their job. And then some other mathematician would come with the next chunk and it was okay you didn't have to come up with like the ultimatum or the ultimate truth and i think that when you frame it like artists being able to have like nuanced questioning like we could take out a chunk of that problem and just work on that like that and that's fine we don't have to work about like a big big everything be a generalist about everything and um i'm hearing that from a lot of young women of color POC, like art historians, they're, when I'm touching base with them, they're telling me that they're like, well, Mario, like, we don't have to be generalist in relationship to like an institutional study of like race or ethnicity or gender. Like we could take apart like a one nuanced chunk and that will be our field of study. And I was like, yeah, because like generations ahead of us had to, they were the generalist because there was nobody else in the field. So like, I'm being more fluid about the understanding, right? Because yeah, it could change. It could change. It could change. And they just, they're just like, I just want to focus on this. Like nobody would have questioned that from some medieval person that just wanted to focus on like one year of some letters or something, right? Like, so I'm thinking like for us, like we don't necessarily have to be generalist for everybody either, but we could take on kind of, like you're saying, nuanced little portions and questions and take those on. Um, we have a question for you again, Ami, if you could answer this. Uh, can you talk about like how you uh, maneuver between like the duality of being like an artist and an administrator with the, the center? Like how did the approach change or is it the same approach? How do you work with that? Okay, it, um, it's definitely complicated. It's very complicated, especially when it comes to time allotment and being structured with time. Um, my job as an administrator, it, I mean, it, it's kind of, it consumes a lot of my time because I'm also very passionate about what I do there. Um, and I'm very committed to the community members that I work with and, um, and having a great staff is really important. So working with great colleagues um, super important um, that there not be power trips between us and stuff like that. But then, I mean, at the very end, it, it's there are difficult processes like 
Like I gotta check on people's time all the time. I gotta, you know, like I gotta stand up above. I I can't stand it because I'm like, I don't care. You do you, I do me. And then I realize, oh, I can't. <laughs> I can't just do me, can I? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah, it's definitely complicated. But you know, we are very passionate people working at Rolling Grant Still, and that's what makes it really different. And people who genuinely love the community and love that space and um and right now especially in a time where um you know the neighborhood is is uh, very violently being gentrified violently being gentrified um the folks that i work with are really passionate about making sure that the history and the culture and um you know what would happen there continues so with working with great colleagues who also support me as an artist, I don't mix the two up. I never show my own work there. I don't promote my own work there. It's not about that, but I am my work. Like I said, my brain is my studio. So I am my work. So no matter what, it flows over into what I'm doing there. So yeah, since I've been there, we focused on grassroots archives because that's what I'm into. I'm into the, the histories that everyday people keep. So, um, so it does, it does overlap to a certain extent. I think I didn't answer that question. I'm sorry. No, you did. No, I think you okay. did. No, I, I think that that was a good way. Like I, uh, top priority, have good people around you, man. Like if you have good yeah. people around you that are also dedicated and also, um, doing what they need to be doing, it makes it much easier to get the job done, especially when you're doing kind of the work that y'all do over there where you're working with like you know, grassroots folks and uh, exhibitions that are, aren't necessarily like uh, already boxed for you. You're like digging through boxes to make your exhibitions. Like uh, two of the great exhibitions, just to plug some of the things that you've been doing there. Uh, you had a really great exhibition a few months ago that I was able to moderate a panel on with the RTN graffiti crew, the Rock in the Nation crew. Yeah. Uh, shout out to Create and all the folks that are in RTN. It was like a, was it a 30 year, like kind of retrospective of, all of their, all of their yeah. photographs. And, and it was all things from, pulled from photo albums and newspapers that it was really intriguing to see uh, that type of history. What you're saying are these kind of, um, uh, what what is the word you you had a better word than I had? I'm thinking like grassroots archive uh, community yeah, grassroots archive. archive. Grassroots yeah, that, that that's what you're doing, yeah. and then uh, and then you that do annually. Y'all do it like annually. You you annual yeah. Then you annually at the center you do an African American doll show, right? Fortieth With... year. This coming year is going to be the fortieth year. Fortieth year. Years. Yeah, that's the amazing. longest running exhibition in the city of Los Angeles. That's the longest amazing. running annual exhibition. And that, that coincides yeah. with the exhibitions and workshops and all these really great things where you have the people come and make dolls and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then the mo the show that just got kind of put on pause uh, for the COVID quarantine was amazing music history show on the Latin jazz performer, percussionist, Willie Bobo, right? And yeah. it was an exhibition of his, from his archives and his family archives and his uh, yeah. discology. It, um, can you plug the radio show that you are doing with the center? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, um, we are doing uh, a radio program with KQBH, um, Boyle Heights Conservatory. And um, we, uh, every Sunday at 5 p.m., we have a radio show that is hosted by um, Peter Woods and it's kind of based on, on the show. We also at 6 p.m. go live on the Willy Bobo uh, fan Facebook page. So the official Willy Bobo fan uh, Facebook page. So this uh, Sunday, we're gonna go live at 6 p.m. to play the early uh, albums of, of Willy Bobo. And then the following Sunday, I co-curated that exhibition with Eric Bobo, his son. And Eric and I are gonna do a virtual walkthrough and discuss everything in the exhibition on the Willie Bobo and ours. You know, it's gonna be like joint, the William Grant Still and Willie Bobo. So and thank you for give, plugging that. Yeah, and can you give us, can you plug your own stuff, your, your website again and your social media yeah. if you want us to look at that? 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, my friend just convinced me to open up my Instagram. So my Instagram is open. Follow me, Ami Geddon, yeah. because uh, a lot of the work that I'm doing, I, you know, I share it in weird ways. I, I don't share the finished work. I share process and inspiration. So that's Ami Geddon. And then my website is my full name, amitismotavalli.com, which is where kind of the information and, and, um, and everything else is at. Um, so yeah, that's me. Awesome, awesome. And Rafa, can you plug your social media and website again for us too, please? Where they could, people know to, where to buy your books and prints and all the awesome stuff you've been up to? Yeah, thanks a lot. And thank you, Mario, for all this. Um, my website is, is www dot rafa dot la and instagram rafa dot la so wow. i got awesome thank you too oh so can much i plug for... one other thing sure sure my i have a friend i'm actually her slave her name is the sand ninja and uh the sand ninja also has uh an instagram page and she has okay. a soundcloud and she has a really great mix on the soundcloud and she's working on further mixes for the SoundCloud, so follow the Sand Ninja. I don't know her, and for some reason, she and I never show up in the same place at once. But <laughs> all right, perfect. We have those two, and then for me, if y'all want to follow me, uh, my Instagram is Mario underscore Ibarra underscore Junior. Uh, that's my personal account. And if you want to follow uh, the studio, it's uh, Slanguage Studio on Instagram. I just found out my Slanguage Studio website's inactive. I guess I didn't pay a bill somewhere, but. Uh, but you can find us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I usually tend to post things every day. Uh, so please join us. And please, um, last thing we need to make sure we plug is next week, Wednesday, uh, June 3rd at 7 p.m. We're going to be doing another In the Studio Artist Lab with Self Help Graphics. Uh, so please join us uh, next Wednesday um, for some awesome folks talking then. Um, thanks again to Self Help Graphics for bringing Thank us you, together. Thank you, Self Help Graphics. Yeah, Yay. thanks Alexa for keeping us on track and Marvea for being just awesome. as <laughs> She always is. And um, again, I'm Mario Ibarra Jr. Uh, peace, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>